Thank you for the introduction, Piero. So it's wonderful to be here, a very excited audience. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a little bit, about what role, in fact, I'm going to tell you about the question as to what role quantum mechanics plays in biology. And uh, the angel up on the top here is a wonderful angel who is the logo of the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, where I spent uh, a year thinking about these issues uh, two years ago. So, so this is a, a bit of a small report of um, things that people are exploring nowadays <coughs> in search for understanding, or first of all identifying, characterizing, and then also understanding uh, quantum effects in biological <coughs> systems. And these effects range from effects in photosynthesis, both in plants and also in bacteria, such as these bacteria which live in these vents 2,000 um, meters under the sea, uh, and also in uh, animal smell, olfaction, uh, ion channels, eventually even the brain. Lots have been speculated about that, but I will not talk about that today. Uh, the two topics I'll talk about will be the photosynthesis and also bird navigation. And so there's a lot of buzz whenever anyone makes a claim that there's a quantum mechanical effect uh, visible in a biological system. So, for instance, this was actually photosynthesis from my colleague, Graham Fleming, uh, who I'll tell you about his experiments. And so he, he was unlocking the, or is unlocking the quantum secrets of life. So this is always a very popular topic in this popular science media. So and in terms of physics, <coughs> Uh, this really touches on a very, uh, it's almost, almost eternal issue in understanding uh, where quantum mechanics is valid and where it's not valid or possibly where it stops. Does it stop? We don't. Uh, there's lots of debate about this. And this is a somewhat playful cartoon from a colleague in Los Alamos, some of you may have heard of him, Wojciech Zurek who illustrates rather nicely the, the delineation between a classical regime where everything's very recognizable and you have to stop and show your classical apparatus before you can then go on into this more Alice in Wonderland type of world <laughs> where everything's fuzzy, things bifurcate, where we can have interference between different parts, and here's a cat which is both alive and dead. <laughs> so we really still don't know where this border is and how to characterize this border. Maybe it's not a border, maybe it's some really jaggedy um, path. But in biology, <coughs> this question comes up again and again. Now, what I'm going to start is actually, first of all, to point out that quantum biology, although it's often said it's a very recent new field, it actually is a rather old field. And if you like to use a biological simile, it has very long roots. So in fact, it was. Bohr, who after he had mopped up all of atomic physics, uh, who first started talking about possible quantum effects in biology. Uh, from about 1929 onwards, he basically spent the rest of his life thinking about this. And also with Paul Jordan, who was the one who coined the term quantum biology. But the first he, uh, person who, the first physicist who really was a true quantum biologist was actually a student of Bohr's, um, Max Delbruck who was a true quantum biologist because he, rather than just talking about it, he actually sat down and worked, went and talked to his biological friends, the geneticist and also a photobiologist. And I'm not sure what I've done now. Uh, what have we done here? There are. Oh, it's here. There you go. It's back? Yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, so Max Delbruck actually sat down and worked together in a true collaboration with some biologists. And he was, they were probing the genetic, what they called genetic structure, basically the, what they didn't know at the time was the genetic structure, but the behavior, uh, particular mutations of genetic material with x-rays. This was a true, the first quantum probe of biological structures and function because they truly acknowledged the need to understand the detailed molecular structure of a functional biological system. So this was a very modern perspective, and it's still the perspective we have today. So what we're doing today is we're really trying to extend this over all length scales here, from atoms and molecules, uh, sort of smaller biological objects, now cells, organized structures, all the way up to 
uh, sort of human sized structures. And on the other side, the time scale, going again from the small time scales of electrons and atoms, we normally don't go below that, um, all the way up to, again, human types of time scales. And so in recent years, we've had immense advances in the tools, which are indicated here, which take us down further and further on both the length scales and the time scales. And we know that function is, has also this uh, downward uh, delving into how we understand function, eventually at the molecular level. And we, we presume that somewhere between the, the smallest structures where we know to describe their behaviors, like when they're isolated, we have to use quantum mechanics. And these much larger structures with which we normally associate biological systems, there's a transition, but we don't know where this transition is. And moreover, although we're doing very well these days, we're bringing these tools down into the um, molecular and atomic level. We aren't doing very well at all in going back up in the functional sense this way. In other words, we have lots of detailed structure. We have some dynamical information, as I'll show you. But we don't really understand very well how to translate that knowledge of structure and dynamics into an understanding of the biological function. So it's really, that's really an open um, field. And so in the context of the quantum uh, mechanics, it's really an open question whether quantum coherence is relevant to the biological function. So I won't give you a full answer to that yet. So I often divide quantum biology into uh, like an AC, AD and a, um, a BC and an AD period, sort of before and after. And the before and after here refers to the laser. So in fact, the invention of the laser just uh, passed away uh, last week in Berkeley, uh, Charles Towns. Um, and in terms of biology, the laser development had a huge impact in terms of understanding quantum dynamical effects. So the first era, I would say, classifies basically prior to the structure, the molecular structure of DNA. You could say also that it ended, it, it was all summarized, the first era was summarized in Schrodinger's little book, What is Life, which summarized primarily Max Delbruck's work. And this was basically all on the, the acknowledgement that molecules are quantum mechanical, so they have molecular energy levels and also the pathways, the way which they rearrange themselves, uh, can be determined by quantum chemical calculations, energy barriers, and so this is what we would call fairly straightforward, oh, we nod our heads, yes, yes, of course, bio quantum. But the second era, in a sense, is more interesting, because with a laser, we can now look not at only structure and energetics, but we could look at dynamics. And in particular, there's, uh, in fact, even since the 1960s, there are new generations of dynamical probes coming online all the time. There are new tools and innovation also coming online with quantum science and, and technology. And that's how I got into this subject. So this is a somewhat futuristic um, uh, picture from my colleague showing the bay. And there's a and, um, small photosynthetic molecule complex here. And these are the coherences I'll show you. And then here's sunlight coming in or basis. Um, we, we hope to harness these tools sometime. So, so these are the kind of things that people are bringing into the field today. Uh, microscopic probes here, even of living cells, where this is from um, the group of Hong Kong Park at Harvard, who uh, put a living cell on top of little nano rods of silicon, which offers access directly into the cell, and they can then monitor the cell cellular response to adding chemicals or making electrical uh, stimulation and so on. And <coughs> secondly here, this is a, what I'll, uh, is relevant to the photosynthetic systems. This is a very uh, sophisticated form of spectroscopy where one's employing <laughs> multiple laser beams coming in with specified time delays and also specified relative spatial relationships that allows one to basically tease out the internal dynamics of the biological system on an ultra-fast time scale, meaning 10 to the minus um, 15 seconds, in this case, femtoseconds. And that's exactly the time scale of electronic motions. So this offers a key to understanding electronic dynamics in these systems. So this is just a little cartoon of photosynthesis. Yeah, so this is what's happening here. It's going back to um, yeah, 
Okay, let me. I don't know why Airbus keeps being so persistent. It's never there when you need it. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where am I up to? I'm up to here. All right, this is my cartoon of photosynthesis. Oh, right, here we go. So what we're really going to be interested in here is just the very, very tippy top part of this enormous set of reactions and reorganizations that happens in real photosynthesis. So this is, again, very something to note when you're trying to apply a quantum or a physics technique, you really have to look at a small part. So we're interested in this process uh, of light harvesting, whereby, which is a primary process after light is absorbed, is absorbed by blue absorbing pigments first, then there's an energy funnel, they go down, the light the energy goes down into red absorbing pigments, and it gets then transferred to a special location called the reaction center where charge separation occurs. We generate an electron hole pair, and the electron hole pair does chemistry. We're only interested in this part here. And this is done by all of these um, uh, plants and bacteria. And there are some characteristics, very unusual features about this energy transfer process. So one uh, is summarized here, which is, so this is the energy, energy um, transfer the photosynthetic antenna of green plants. It's called photosystem two. And this really is, you could, you could make an argument to say that this is the most sophisticated nano machine known on Earth. So for instance, take this a rendering of Picasso's tree over here. So this would be a typical tree. But, so we had a, uh, so there was a graduate student in my department who took, undertook the job to estimate how many <coughs> chlorophylls would be present in this typical tree, <coughs> and basically uh, and estimating, knowing how many chlorophylls, there are several hundred chlorophylls in one of these antenna systems, and then there are many hundreds of antenna systems within a single cell. Well, so the answer comes out to be, in a single tree like this, there's only 500 milligrams of chlorophylls. So with this very small, I mean, relative to the size and the weight of a tree, these 500 milligrams produce enough energy for the tree to actually grow and absorb water. It's pretty amazing. <coughs> it's very hard to imagine that we could actually make machines that would be able to do the equivalent thing. OK, so this next slide is a summary of what we mean by this project. So I'm not going to be able to go show through everything. So I've just got a slide here which summarizes the quantum effects in photosynthesis. So it's this process here of absorption and energy conversion that we're interested in. And these natural systems do this process of absorption up to the energy conversion with nearly 100% efficiency. Nearly 100% means, in this case, 97, 98, 99, 99.9. .9. This is amazing. There's no other process in nature that, no, that has such a high efficiency. And what we mean by the efficiency here is that one photon coming in here will produce one electron hole pair there, which goes on to do chemistry. The sec so the second point is that the experiments relieve a kind of re reveal a kind of wave-like energy transfer. And I'll show you, it'll be very, very brief, but I'll show you a little bit the evidence for this. Uh, but the way to think about this is uh, like a football, soccer ball, sorry, Soccer ball going over a rough, uh, my English background. Soccer ball going over a rough field you know, where you don't really want to play soccer. And over here, there is by comparison a golf ball. Now the soccer ball actually does a lot better in going over the rough field because this little golf ball gets stuck inside these hillocks. So, so the analogy is that the excitation energy is spread out over a very rough energy landscape and then it doesn't get trapped. So the soccer ball is like a bigger object, is somewhat more spread out. So that's the that's the conclusion, and the conclusion was rather surprising because if you look at an antenna system like this, so the implication is that a photon is absorbed and that there's some wave-like motion which transfers that excitation to the reaction center, rather than a hopping translation. Well, so actually in this audience, I think as you've all learned about entanglement on the last slide, I don't need to tell you what coherence is. So the coherence is basically that waves move together. So that the, these are, this is a class example of classical coherence. If they pedal together in step, they will not fall over. If they don't, they're on the ground. <laughs> this is uh, quantum coherence where, or it is also class, can be a classical wave coherence where we're having beat 
formed by uh, addition of waves of different frequencies. And this is uh, what we've seen in these experiments. These are these three-dimensional, um, or sorry, three photons absorbed, and one makes a kind of two-dimensional plot, and then of frequencies, and there's an, this time in between is then sampled by repeating this over and over again. And so here's the movie which shows you one of these two-dimensional plots now shown as a sort of mountain landscape. And get to start, and then they take many, many plots like that, and as a function of time, so the time index is increasing here, and you see now that these structures are oscillating in time. So these oscillations are the beats of some wave-like behavior. In this case, you might ask, you might say, well, this could be a classical wave-like behavior, but it's definitely a quantum wave-like behavior because the signal that's being measured here is an amplitude. It's not a, an intensity. It's actually an amplitude of electric field that's being measured. So this goes on and on, and you see also here there's oscillations. So let me terminate that. So we don't. So then we, there's a lot of theoretical work that's been done to, to analyze these kinds of um, oscillations. And so I'm just going to actually s summarize one of the uh, things that have been found out from those calculations, which is that there is an entanglement between these uh, chromophores, which are opposite ends of the antenna complex. And so it's the same kind of entanglement that uh, one knows from quantum physics, in this case, where a molecule on one side would be an excited state, which is correlated with a molecule on the other side being in a ground state, like this, and then vice versa on the other side. So this is the same kind of correlate, quantum correlation that Schrodinger talked about in 1935, I think you've heard about in the previous talk. This is a one artist rendition of this. So basically, if you look at these ambiguous cubes, your brain forces, you, you make a decision subconsciously to go in one direction or the other, and then the other one fits. OK, so the big question is, so I'm going to uh, in real time. The big question here is: Is the quantum coherence relevant to the long? Is relevant to really long-range transfer and then to biological function? Well, we actually now know that it is transmitted between complexes. There have been some very recent experiments showing this, and theoretical work that we've done shows that coherence is indeed transmitted over much longer distances than just within one little antenna complex, which is about three nanometers. It can be transmitted over tens of nanometers. And it enables the direction to go in a, in a unidirectional fashion. The transport to go in a unidirectional fashion enables also uphill transport. So these are the first indications of, no, I'm really sure. These are first indications of biological function. But this is by no means a, uh, a cut and, and dried story. So I'm going to basically leave you with this uh, as, a, as a suggestion for a possible biological functional role. And I'm just going to make some comments about where we go with this from now on. Well, so we're trying to uh, obtain a fundamental understanding of the quantum effects in the very, very unusually efficient energy conversion for, rock for life. And another thing that this helps us do is to think about how we might re-engineer photosynthesis to divine artificial devices for effective quantum enhanced conversion of light or other um, sources of energy into chemical energy. So in particular, if we can do this without competing biological constraints, we might be managed to also engineer, re-engineer and optimize the thermodynamic aspects of photosynthesis, which I haven't talked about, and which are very, very inefficient. Thermodynamically, in terms of the energy you get in versus energy out, you only get about maximum 13% of the energy out from natural photosynthesis. And of course, there are lessons here for the design of robust and sensitive quantum devi devices. And so let me have the last slide maybe showing you a natural organism that has, in a sense, optimized this very well. And this might be a lesson for us to think about. This is a um, green sea slug, or has a much more romantic sounding name, Elysia chlorotica. <laughs> and this animal actually, or is this organism, captures chloroplasts from algae and stores them in its own body so that it can then do its own photosynthesis. So maybe we might eventually rise to the level of this green sea slug. It never, eats to, never needs to eat again after it's absorbed the first initial meal of 
chloroplast because after that it just gets its energy from the sunlight. So you have a big, big breakfast and then you go and lay out in the sun. <laughs> so that's how we do it.